Hello, uh, welcome to 100 Huntley Street. Great to have you with us. Yes, it's a Wednesday, and in this area, it's a very dreary Wednesday. I don't know what it's like where you are. It's kind of a drizzly, dreary. It is. You know, I was watching the Weather Network, and they said for the next couple of days, the high is going to be 15 with drizzle. And then on Friday, things are going to pick up, and the high is going to be 16 with drizzle. So <laughs> there's not really a lot to look forward to in the next couple of days, except for... 100 Huntley Street, so we're glad you're with us. There we go. No bias there at all, but uh, we'll try not. to put a little sunshine in your day. Yeah. And someone that'll help us do that today is Rhonda and her special guest coming up. Rhonda? Coming up later today on 100 Huntley Street, Derek Webb, his music and his story. Find out why he says he sees things upside down later in the hour. Mm. Okay, upside oh, down. Yeah. Got to figure that one out. Uh, one young man that... Uh, a few years back, we had a story on 100 Huntley Street, and Cheryl Weber is uh, one of our field reporters. She'll be giving us an update on uh, Michael Cuccioni. Cuccioni. And he is a young man, a very courageous young man, who mm -hmm. uh, battled cancer and uh, raised hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. for cancer research. And, and I like what it says on his CD, Make a Difference. And mm -hmm. in his short life, he did indeed make a mm -hmm. difference and so you'll want to stay tuned for that report and see ex what his family is up to now, mm -hmm. now and our family was up to of what we've been up to yes yeah. we just we mentioned to you yesterday that we just got back from visiting our daughter she's at evangel university in mm -hmm. springfield missouri our alma mater it's where we met it's where we dated and mm -hmm. got married between our third and fourth year and so there was just a lot of memories down and memory it's hard line. to believe that our, our daughter's there now and we, we wouldn't normally share this, but people tell us that, well, we like to have updates on what's going on with your family and so on. So, so here we go. every once in a while, <laughs> you have to in, indulge us because uh, it, was, it was a special weekend because it was the, the homecoming yeah. weekend. Yeah. And uh, it was also the 50th anniversary of, the of Evangel University. And so that was a big one. The 20th anniversary of our graduating class. Yeah, so we had and a class so reunion. We took lots <laughs> of pictures, and I haven't seen the pictures that you've chosen. Oh. Well, there we go. Well, of course, the big thing was the football game. Yes. That happened uh, Evangel there University at Crusaders. the stadium, and they're doing very well. They're, they're exciting at the beginning as they yeah. busted through the banner and they, they came out onto the field. And Did it great, bring back memories for you? Oh, yeah. Did you play football? I remember that at you that stadium many times. Yeah. And of course, there's Andrea there's was in Andrea. the stands with us, and we yeah. were enjoying the game. Evangel won, by the way. They did win. Oh, and this was at one at of the, the big celebration banquets. The 50th anniversary. We had her with us, all to ourselves, and it was so nice to to have her. So, yeah. It and was, we even think she misses us a little bit, but she's, she, she's having a lot of fun and she's doing well. You know what? That was the highlight of the whole trip is when she looked yeah. right at us and said, I really miss you guys. I thought, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. She's having fun. She's doing great, but she misses us. So yeah. now I can, I can make it through to Christmas <laughs> now. But it's, it's funny to, to go back 20 years later. Maybe some of you have experienced it, a 20 or a 50 yeah. year reunion, uh, to go back and, and see the people you haven't seen for the 20 years and see how they've all kind of changed. Everybody's kind of <laughs> Except changed. Except you, hon, you haven't changed. Well, and, well you just else. have a little gray, but that's all. That's fine. Anyway, it's, uh, it's kind of and humorous almost. And you know, something almost. else that was really nice to see was so many of our former classmates are now in the ministry. Mm -hmm. And it made me think of your brother, Reynolds, who Dad anointed yesterday here on mm -hmm. 100 Huntley Street. Just a beautiful ceremony. And thinking of how the Lord has brought him over the last 20 years into this uh, area, fulfilling his call in God's life for him. And so in, it's just... In the missions area. Yeah. And, and he, he was, of course, at Evangel as well. We went down together on he football scholarships. And, and that was kind yeah. of the whole uh, fun deal way back when. And so he couldn't make it to the reunion. He was actually down in uh, Mississippi, and New Orleans area. Here's a little teeny little tidbit of information for you. His wife, Kathy, whom you know. Kathy and I were all... Kathy was at Evangel University. We were roommates at yeah. school. And Ron and Reynolds, of course, the brothers were roommates, and so eventually we just traded roommates. And so, 20 <laughs> years later, here we are. Got married first. Yes, we did. Uh, important <laughs> to note that. Anyway, we will. Uh, <laughs> I was good to stress that. Yes, we did. Okay, enough about us. Enough about us. It's about you. So That's it's right. about the Lord, actually. This whole program, yeah. and so uh, stay tuned. Don't miss a minute. all for his glory. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. 
That's the theme of two weeks of special programming you won't want to miss, starting next week right here on 100 Huntley Street. So whether you're living out your faith at work or preparing a meal for your family, we want to encourage you to do it all for God's glory. That's why I'm pleased to introduce our very special guest, Dawn Hall, and her cookbook, Down Home Cooking Without the Down Home Fat. I am Welcome, so Dawn. excited about being back on 100 Huntley Street. We are Street. so excited to have you. Thanks for having me. And we get two whole weeks of Down Home Cooking. But without the Down Home Fat. I love that <laughs> title, Dawn. Thank you. Thank you. I really believe my gift for being able to create fast and easy home style recipes with only seven or less ingredients and made in less than 30 minutes is really a gift from God. And I just can't wait to share them with you and everyone else. And as you get to know Dawn and her inspiring story, which actually prompted the cookbook, the recipes really do become that much more special. And we might just convince Ron to put on an apron and get in on it. the fun. So be sure and watch our special programming, all for his glory, from October 17th to the 28th. Well, I don't know how glorious it might, I might look in a, <laughs> in one of well, those things. it's not for your glory, it's for <laughs> his right. glory. But I think we will get you into an apron, dear. Well, I, I know how to do a, an omelet and a, mm -hmm. the odd pancake, and mm -hmm. uh, so, but I can always learn more recipes. Well, the good thing about Dawn's book, and I have looked over it and, and t tried some recipes from it, actually, is they're really easy recipes. They're, they're not that you need easy recipes. No, <laughs> I'm I digging do, myself into a hole here. <laughs> but no, they're, they're few ingredients and 30 minutes or less, and so they are good. And we'll uh, get to know Don a little bit more and kind of have her story unfold over those days that she's with us. And she has, has a powerful story as well, what mm -hmm. God has done in her life. And you'll get to know that. Yeah. Well, right. Ron, eight years ago, we had a very special young man on the program who talked about his battle with cancer and his efforts to raise research funding to stop this terrible disease. Today, Cheryl Weber brings us an update. It was a young life full of promise. Every goal Michael would set, he would reach beyond. So it was a terrible shock when this nine and a half year old was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma, cancer. Well, you can just imagine, I mean, I was an active nine and a half year old boy, loved my sports, loved school activities, and then a bombshell hit my life. It was, it was a shock. Even through that shock, Michael had a positive attitude. He was unbelievable from the very first diagnose. He took it, took it strong. Honest to God, I believe he felt that he's going to beat this thing. But six months of chemotherapy took a devastating toll. There were times where, um, where I couldn't eat and I would be just feeling terrible. But it was watching other kids' pain that hurt the most. Hearing these children crying and, and suffering with this disease, if you don't have the heart to reach out and help, then I don't, I don't know, you know, I don't know how anyone could just walk away and just think, oh, great, it's over for me. He would be playing with kids and be playing Nintendo with a, a, a little friend, and the next week the little friend would be gone. Michael dedicated himself to help find a cure for this horrible disease. And even as he was undergoing chemotherapy, he was writing music. During this time, I wrote five songs and I've got a CD out to raise money for cancer research. But one person can only do so much. But together, we can make a difference. And here he was suffering. All he was doing was worrying about other people suffering. Put this CD out and raise $130,000 for the sale of this CD by the time he was 11 years old. Soon the Cuccionis received the news they were hoping for. Michael was cancer free. Six blissful months went by as they celebrated his recovery, but it wasn't to last. They called me back and they said, we, we, we believe Michael's cancer's back. We need to have him back in. I'm not kidding you. I, 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 just, I just don't no, even know how, I, how, how, how am I gonna tell my boy that he's got all these plans and he's got to go back, and this time it's a bone marrow transplant. It was during those tough times, Michael says, that his faith in God sustained him. 
I was confused, but I never once blamed God because I knew in the back of my mind all the time, even before I had this disease, that everything was happened for a reason and everything was meant to be. And I remember one prayer distinctively when I was in bone marrow transplant, and I remember asking him to get me through this as fast and as easy as possible so I could start doing what I had planned to do and making this difference. He still to this day had official step down on day plus, uh, day plus nine, which is unheard of, where you get three consecutive rises of your white blood cells, and that's when you're getting your, your lifeline back from your bone marrow transplant. He is still to this day the only one that's done that. So God heard him. Please welcome to the stage from Vancouver, BC, Michael Cuccioni. Once again, Michael was cancer free and he was more determined than ever to make the most of his newly restored life. Basically, you know, try to accomplish as much as you can because you never know when something might just stop like that, stop your life. And at least, you know, you've, you've just got to gotta work at accomplishing as, as much as you can, even in, in, in one day. Michael seemed to be everywhere, from meeting with top government officials and spiritual leaders, from co-writing a book with his grandmother on cancer survival, to making a guest appearance on Baywatch and starring in an MTV show. It seemed nothing could hold this boy back. But he never forgot those he left behind. Although I'm healthy and... You know, I, I don't have to worry about that part of my life anymore as far as going through that, that disease ever again. I, I still have a bigger battle, and that battle is to see that every child doesn't have to go through cancer. Every person doesn't have to go through cancer. And you got to persevere. But Michael was increasingly suffering respiratory problems. Although he beat cancer twice, in the end, the effects of his severe treatment ended his promising life prematurely. There's no doubt his, his lungs were damaged, his breathing was compromised, and, you know, it, it was a sad ending because for somebody to fight so hard and to win that battle and then to have, have a secondary situation take your life, it really hurts, and you feel very defeated. But, you know, like Michael said, you know, you don't give up on uh, ever. You fight. I mean, because you can win these diseases, and you can, you can, you can have a, a life after cancer. But then there's the other side that's your fate. And if God wants to take you home early, and if there's a reason why you have to leave this world, it's going to happen, no matter what. The Cuccionis enjoyed the radiance of that young life for 16 years and eight days. I was honored to be chosen as Michael's father because I honestly do believe that God puts people on this earth for a purpose. He taught me so many things at his young age. To lose a child is, uh, is al almost unbearable, but God doesn't give us any more than, than we can handle. And we're not alone. We're not the only ones that have lost our precious child. Uh, but I do understand parents that find it difficult to go on, but you must go on. You really must because they want us to be happy again. They want us to, 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 to enjoy our lives. If anything good could ever come from the death of a child, this may be it. The foundation created in Michael Cuccioni's memory funds two pediatric cancer researchers here in the hope that one day a cure could be found for this devastating disease. It's how Michael left this world. He left with such a positive attitude, even to the last breath, you know. Uh, he just was an amazing kid that it was all of a sudden within me to, to continue this mission of hope, faith, and love, in his words. And here we are. He's been gone for four years. And he worked hard for the, where we've been 10 years working hard to find a cure for cancer at a childhood level. With Michael's visions and his, his determination, he worked hard for five of them. And he sat down at Children's Hospital and they said, what do you want to do with the money, Mike? He says, I want to fund young researchers because if we don't fund them, we're not going to have them in the future. And what if the cure is in a child? And God bless him, he's funded an amazing, amazing team. 
One researcher that benefited from Michael's generosity is Dr. Sandra Dunn. I walk over to the hospital and I see little kids who really need help. And I think I am making a difference. I know it. I know that, that we work really, really hard. And, and then all of a sudden the light goes on and, and you know that you've changed in just a short time. You've changed the way we, we look at cancer. We've changed the way we're approaching the problem. She says there's little funding for childhood cancer research compared to adults, even though it's the second leading cause of death for kids in developed nations. I think where, where childhood cancer is extremely unique is in the sense that the, the ramifications of treatment can have long-term detrimental effects for children because children are developing during the time that they're diagnosed with cancer. Then they're faced in that those little children are, are treated with chemotherapy and radiation and, and the unfortunate consequence of trying to cure the disease is that we often damage tissues that are developing. So normal brain function, auditory functions, sometimes children never actually regain those functions. Dr. Chris Fryer, pediatric oncologist at BC Children's Hospital, believes research is important because childhood cancers are different. There's a tremendous environmental uh, issue with adult cancers, but children haven't been exposed to those environmental issues, and they can develop cancers as, as young as, as, as the newborn even. And so we recognize now the importance of directing uh, research to those aspects, to the genetic aspects. Dr. Dunn says she's already made huge strides in her four years funded by the Cuccioni Foundation. We can look at a tumor now and we can say, this tumor is going to be really bad and this tumor is not going to be so bad. So maybe we can make it, we can change the way the kids are being treated so the tumors that, that have the signature proteins that really don't look too bad, maybe they don't need as much chemotherapy, for example. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can spare them some of those side effects that we talked about. The foundation has now launched a $3 million campaign to fund the Michael Cuccioni Lab for Pediatric Cancer Research at BC Children's Hospital. They are currently recruiting a world-renowned research team that will be financially supported for a lifetime. Their goal is amazing. We cannot do it without the investment, without the intellectual investment. It's, it's like a magnet. When we bring in that key person to, to lead and the, the Cuccioni Laboratory, that will bring excellence. It will have a, a ripple effect. And it all comes back to a little boy who fought courageously against a devastating disease. We need to find the cure now. Even Michael, with all his faith, may not have been able to imagine what his short life would inspire. He's an amazing person, and I think that his, his experience was, was very, very sad, but it was turned around into something so powerful and so beyond what any of us could have ever imagined that I, I I just think that um, we're lucky in a way to, for his unfortunate situation, we're really, really lucky that his, his family, had, they've taken something really bad and made it into something really good for other people. And if I look back to the time when my son was with us and all the things that Michael would say had all been truthful and by him saying to me that what if the cure is in one of these kids I think he's on something no, definitely. and hopefully we'll all be here celebrating the cure for cancer out of the Michael Cuccioni laboratory at the Research Institute at Children's Hospital then it'll all make, make sense, sense. Say that, that um, you only live to be 10, and another person lives to be 85. But this 10-year-old tries so hard to accomplish all of his goals, and right. does, when the 80-year-old only accomplish, accomplishes half of his, his or her goals. Or less. And never really tries to That's live. Right. Exactly. So who, who has a better, better life? life. Wow.
an inspiring story of a, an amazing and courageous young man, Michael Cuccioni. And uh, I know you uh, were kind of fighting back the tears, probably as, as many uh, who are watching, as uh, you're touched by, uh, by that young man's story. And uh, I know you can't even talk right now, so let me just, uh, just add that um, the uh, family, the uh, parents of Michael are continuing the uh, the battle, the the fight against cancer with their uh, uh, campaign. They're currently on. Uh, you heard raising, you know, aiming for three million dollars for the uh, the research uh, institute that they have there in Michael's name, and they're uh, having these little wristbands. I don't know if you can see that, but it says "Making a Difference," and. Uh, through their website, which you can connect to through crossroads.ca, our, our website. You can find out more about that and more. <clears throat> it'll link to their website so you can find out uh, what's happening. Or there may be a, a way to get some of the products available, his CD and the book that he, he wrote as well. And so um, it's very, very sad in one way but uh, but very, very inspiring. inspiring in the other. I love what Michael said at the end there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's how much of your life you actually devote towards achieving your mm -hmm. goals. That's the, the true measure of a life. And mm -hmm. so as you surrender your life to God, mm -hmm. He will empower you to be able to achieve your goals. Yeah. And let me just add, uh, we, we do have prayer lines available if, if perhaps you or someone you know, uh, a loved one is going through cancer and you'd like us to join our faith with you in prayer. Uh, we would love to do that. And so you can call any time, 24 hours a day, when you see the prayer lines uh, come up on the screen. Go ahead and call the one closest to you. Well, coming up in uh, just a moment, Michael Bell with Money Matters. So we'll be right back. On the next 100 Huntley Street, India's Bollywood is the largest film industry in the world. Hear the compelling story of one of its well-known classical singers, Vijay Benedict. Also, young people from across the country are flocking to Prince Edward Island. Find out why on the next 100 Huntley Street. Don't miss it. Hello. Oh, last time we saw how the slow burn principle describes the gradual unconscious drift deep into debt. A toehold becomes a foothold, then a stronghold, and finally a stranglehold. First we borrow small amounts, often without thinking about the full effects, and then rising amounts until our loans shock and depress us. Desperately we start believing lies some television evangelists tell us. So in my ministry they say, so God can give you a financial blessing. But they ignore our condition and so do we as we add yet another charge to our credit cards. Today I want to share with you seven warning signs that you're a victim or you're about to become a victim of the slow burn principle. These signs come from my experience working with individuals and couples over the past 10 years. Each sign's effect is different, but each gives the same message. Your financial condition is declining because of your behavior. In essence, finances are controlling or about to control your life. Like a frog in a beaker that does not feel the rising heat, you have become insensitive to extra debt. Stop. Turn to the Lord. Accept His way forward. Here are the seven signs which I'll explain later. Giving stopped or reduced. Income increases, but debt increases. Credit card balances unpaid. Debt being consolidated. Insurance policies cashed. Extended terms or juggling bills. Savings used to pay bills. Let's look at each. First, if you stopped or never started giving money, time and talents to the Lord, you haven't surrendered these areas to Him. Ask Jesus to show you how to use funds you get. 
They belong to Him. If you're not presenting 100% to Him and allowing Him to direct how you share them, you won't hear His voice and won't see His solutions to your circumstances because you'll be preoccupied with you. Second, if your income has been rising but debt climbs too, that's a reminder you are spending beyond your means. Sadly, it is our normal condition because we don't save to buy stuff. Decide to freeze your yearly spending level for at least two years. Give 100% of income increases in these two years to the Lord. Third, if you can't pay your credit card balances in food monthly, you can't afford to keep a credit card. A credit card is a check. Use it for budgeted items only and when you have funds in the bank. Never use it to spend based on your emotions. Cut it up if you think it's causing you to spend money that you don't have. Do you know you'll spend about 30% less if you spend cash? Usually, improper credit card use starts the slow burn process. Meditate on 2 Kings 4, 1 to 7. Fourth, if you're thinking about consolidating debt, you are well along the slow burn path. Debt consolidation doesn't work unless you change the behaviors that cause the debt. Consolidation could be your enemy because it looks good on paper, but often you forget you must change to get the benefits. If you're thinking to consolidate debt, ensure you have changed the behavior. Ask God to bring a strong Christian person to encourage your walk with Him. Proverbs 27, 17 reminds us, As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Sometimes there are valid reasons to do the fifth sign, cash in an insurance policy. This is an issue only if your motive is to get cash to spend because you're in debt. Watch out. Seek help. Ask Jesus to keep you focused on his promises. Many folks know they are in the slow burn path from the sixth sign, delaying bill payments and paying some only partly. Delaying the hydro bill to pay a part of the phone bill, for example, is a clear sign you need to change your attitude to money. The seventh sign applies to many Canadians. They have used savings to pay regular bills, a key early slow burn principle indicator. Are you on the slow burn path? Many folks are there but don't know because they rationali rationalize their spending. Ask Jesus to show you where you are and how you can join him where he is. God bless and remember, Jesus loves you. All right. Thanks so much, Michael. I love the way he ends that I with the, the Jesus loves you. And Michael uh, does a fair bit of traveling and, and sharing his insights on, uh, on money from a biblical perspective. And he's, in fact, going to be in uh, the area. Uh, so if you're in this area, uh, in the Guelph Bible Conference uh, Center, mm -hmm. November 25 to 27, Getting a Grip on Time and Money mm, with Michael good Bell. Title. And so it's there in Guelph if you want... Uh, to register, you want to hear a, a lot more of this great teaching, 905-854-5975. Or you can uh, log on to his website at managinggodsmoney.com. I like that, Managing God's Money. It really uh, gives the bottom line right there in that proper title. perspective. He owns everything. He does. Yeah. Well, Ron, we are now going to uh, meet a young man who mm -hmm. used to be a member of a very popular band called... Cademan's Call. Cademan's Call. I knew that. All right. And Derek Webb is his name. And uh, he has a, a CD out because we're going to be talking to him later. Rhonda is going to be getting his story. Now, can you read uh, the title of his CD <laughs> there? If you turn on, stand on your head, you can because it says, I see things upside down. <laughs> so we'll have to find out what that means when Rhonda talks to him mm -hmm. uh, after he sings, though. But he's going to sing a song called Rich Young Ruler. Let's All welcome right. Derek Webb.
20 miles across town Where we're all living so good And we went down to Jesus' neighborhood Where he's hungry and not feeling so good From going through our trash He says more than just your can't give me So what must we do Here in the West we want to follow you We speak a language and we keep all the rules Even a few we made up Come on and follow me Let's tell you SUV, sell your stock, sell your security, and give it to the poor. Well, what is this? Hey, what's the deal? I don't sleep around and I don't steal, but I want the things you just can't give me. Just can't give me Because what you do to the least of the Just can't give me I want the things you just can't give me Derek Webb's latest CD is called I See Things Upside Down, and it's a collection of songs taken directly from his own life. And what a life. It's been quite a journey for Derek, going from a band that sold a million CDs during the past 10 years and playing in front of thousands to audiences that could fit in your living room, quite literally. He's here to tell us all about it. Please welcome Derek Webb to 100 Huntley Street. Derek, come and join me in the family room. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see you. Yeah, you as well. So, I see things upside down. What is that all about? Um, well, we thought that would be a good title for the new record um, because a lot of the songs, um, just coming out of my story, um, are songs about um, um, learning how to see um, kingdom values in everyday life, which is a really difficult thing to do because we live in a society where uh, we're, we're taught to value a certain thing or that success looks like a certain thing. Um, and often what uh, Kingdom Values would tell us is that, that poverty can mean riches, uh, that failure can mean success, um, because the question we ask is not why do these things happen, but under what end do these things happen. Um, and so when I left Cademan's, and you know, here was a, a pretty steady job for some years, um, and next found myself l literally playing in people's living rooms. Um, and people would ask me, how's your career going? And I would say, well, I, I don't know. I, I think if you looked at it from the outside, it might look like I'm failing miserably, like maybe the whole thing's over with. But I feel like I'm more successful now than I have been at any other point in my career because I really feel as though this is what God has for me to do. And, um, and so I, you start to redefine words like success. What does that even really mean? Um, and often the kingdom would tell us that it's upside down from what we, from what what we think. What do you mean, kingdom values? Um, uh, the, the, the least being greatest and the first being last. Um, you know, we, we, we live in a world where... Uh, power is valued very highly, and yet we had the most powerful man of all time, Jesus, 
come and wash the feet of those who followed him. Um, he made himself nothing on our behalf that we would be exalted. And that is completely radical and upside down from anything that we see in our culture as far as what we're taught about value and what makes us who we are, what gives us the identities that we have. And it's about me gaining power for myself, having influence. Um, and Jesus would tell us the opposite many times. And um, it's still, a hard thing to continue with. <laughs> what would make you decide to leave a band that sold a million CDs during the past 10 years uh, to go out on your own mm -hmm. and, and literally go from playing in front of thousands mm -hmm. to a handful of people? Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you, being greedy and selfish as I am, um, the only thing that could possibly have called me out of that situation, and that is just the Lord's hand. I mean, I, it just, and I, and I don't mean to use rhetoric, and I don't mean to say something that could mean any number of things to any number of people, but in my story, for me, it really was going from a situation um, that I, I really did feel called into when I was just starting college, which was Cademan's Call. We started that band in, 90, uh, in 92, and, um, and that was a great part of my story for many years. Um, but there was a point, just after I got married, um, like anyone who, after they get married, will tell you, it starts to redefine every other relationship you're in. Right. You start to account for all of your time and find out what am I pouring myself into and is that something worth taking me away from my wife? Well, um, it's pretty shocking the way marriage can change your perspective on everything. Everything, on everything. everything. And it certainly did for me. And, <laughs> and so it was at that point that I just stopped and said, you know, I've been in this band for 10 years. And I do feel like um, there, there are gifts I have that I can bring to this situation corporately with these people. Um, but am I using all the gifts that I have? Are, are there other things God would, might, might have me do or, or desire for me to do? And in thinking about that, I, I just, I, I really sensed a call out of that situation and into what I'm doing now. And, um, and so I, I really, like, I value every one of those 50 people who come into those living rooms. I mean, with my first record, it was a record about the church. Um, it was a. It was. Uh, it was. The record was called "I See Things" or uh, "She Must and Shall Go Free." They all have these long running titles, so I, even I can't keep them straight. How do I expect anyone else to? Um, "She Must and Shall Go Free." It was. It was a record about the church, okay. um, and in in making sure anyone who writes a record about the church, if you base it on the Bible, um, it's a lot of beautiful and encouraging and hopeful language, but it's also a lot of pretty rough language uh, as far as how the church is talked about, especially in parts of the Old Testament. Uh, where we're told, you know, the extent of our idolatry. Well, in fact, you say of she must and shall go free, that it really wasn't a CD, it was a thesis. It was. It's an emphatic statement, and, it's, and it comes out of a hymn. Um, it was written by William Gadsby, actually, like in the 18th century. And, um, and I thought that was such a great thesis for the record. Um, she must and shall go free. It, it, regardless of what we believe mm -hmm. about our current situation and about the church and how hopeless things seem at times, we are guaranteed by the blood of Jesus that we are going to go free, that the church, um, that, that regardless of how we want to chain ourselves up to new moralism and a new law that we create for ourselves to try to please the Lord, um, that the truth is that we must go free, we shall go free, and the reason is because our righteousness is Jesus, because God will never love me, not now, not in glory, any more than He loves me now or on the day I was saved, because my righteousness is, is the fact that Jesus kept the law on my behalf and not that I can keep the law in the least. And since that's not an easy thing to deal with on one record in four-minute songs, I thought, you know, I want to make sure people can ask me questions. I want to make sure that if they have questions about this CD and about mm -hmm. the content on the CD, that they can approach me, they can ask me questions. So we thought, well, what better way to do that than to take away all the things that keep me distant from an audience. And generally that's a PA, which I can be louder than them. A stage, I can be taller than them. I'm only five foot nothing, I don't know. Um, you know, lights, that they're dark on them and bright on me. So let's just take all that away and let me maybe go into people's houses. I mean, people are very at ease and they'll talk, not like you're uh, a celebrity or something when you're in their house, because it's their house, for Pete's mm -hmm. sake. And so I started to play shows in people's living rooms and toured for a whole year doing that. And, and wow. between songs, people would say, you know, I didn't get that in that last song. Or, are you saying this? What do you mean by that? And a discussion would break out, and all of a sudden the whole room would be talking. And I learned as much during that tour as anyone else did. It was amazing. Um, so I, mean, I valued that time quite a bit. That's what started to redefine success for me. Well, I'll ask you the corollary to this question in a moment, but what do you see as the biggest challenge facing the church right now? Hmm. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges for the church um, is to start being known for the right things. I think the church, Christian people, are, are easy folks to spot. 
on the whole. I think we're pretty well known in our cultures, in the circles that we run in, but it's for all the wrong things. Um, I think the right place you can go to find out what are the right things to be known for is straight to Jesus. When he was asked in the first century, you know, what are the most important things we should be focusing on? Uh, they, they asked him actually specifically, of all the commandments, what are the most important? What, should we, what, what are the most important things for us to focus on? And it's interesting that Jesus did not say, um, don't drink, don't smoke, don't right. curse, don't dance, don't have premarital sex. And all these things are important. And all these things deserve our attention. There's no doubt about it. Things we should grapple with. But that's not what he said. Jesus answered when he could have answered anything. He said, there are two things. And that is that you love God with all your heart, your soul, your strength. And you love your neighbors, yourself. Those are the two most important things for you to do. And when I look around my busy Christian life, and I think about how much of what I'm doing really has anything to do whatsoever with simply loving God and loving my neighbor, and how much of it has to do actually with the opposite of that, of alienating, judging my neighbor. Because mm -hmm. your neighbor, it doesn't say your Christian neighbor. It doesn't say, That's it doesn't say it love doesn't. your neighbor. In fact, in the story you used with the Good Samaritan, I mean, they were men of two different, it was a, it was a, you know, uh, a Samaritan and a, and, a, and a Jew, they were two violently opposed races and religions. It's helping your enemies. It's loving your enemies, which is even a bigger teaching of Jesus. It's even more difficult in our times. But, you know, when you look at that, you, you, I mean, how much of what I do really has anything to do with loving my neighbor? M most of it has to do, again, with, with the opposite, you know. Um, and so I started to think about, and that's a lot of what my new record, I've got a new record coming out in December um, called Mockingbird. And um, a lot of it is about issues like this. Um, who is my neighbor? If it's Because, it, again, it doesn't say my Christian neighbor. It doesn't say love your neighbor in as far as you can do something for them and then get them to come to church with you. And, you know, it, it just says to love. Um, and the example you use is just to, to care for the immediate needs of not only the physical but also the spiritual needs of our neighbors. And your neighbor... Nowadays, because of the internet and global economy, could be the person living in the house next to you. It could be the people starving in Africa right now. It could be the people suffering from the tragedy um, in New Orleans and, and Louisiana, Mississippi area, Alabama. I mean, these are our neighbors. We're, we're intimately connected our way of life with all these people at this point in history. Um, we have to learn where the needs of our world are, and we need to go and have the government get in line behind us to take care of these people. Well, the flip side of that question is what is the church's greatest asset in these days? What does the church yes. really have going for her? The church has Jesus going for her. <laughs> um, Jesus is the church's greatest asset. Um, the fact that we have a hope in as much as we hope in our, in, in our own salvation, uh, in, the, in the fact that Christ is coming back, um, we, ho we, we have that same hope in the fact that he is in the process of making his bride beautiful, um, cleansing her with his own word, um, that is the process we're in. And, and we might not be pretty now, um, but uh, the church is, is on that journey. Um, and in, in as far as I hope in my own salvation, I, I have a hope that the church will be victorious. I'm guaranteed of it. Uh, and it's not because we certainly do anything right. Uh, we mess up quite a bit. Um, we're a, you know, an arrogant bunch, um, an arrogant, judgmental bunch. But, uh, but Jesus is in the process of making us beautiful, and he's returning for us. And that is our greatest asset. That's our greatest hope. Well, your CDs tell such intricate stories. What story do you want to tell with your latest, well, the CD that is about to come out? Yeah, the new CD is called Mockingbird, and it um, comes out in December. And It's hard to get used to the short title. I know. Derek. All these super long titles. <laughs> and we can still add to it. What's There's the one-word title? I know. I thought it was time for a change. Um, the, the, the new CD, this is funny. I mean, being, I, I got married about five years ago. And when you get married, and people who are married you will totally understand this, you suddenly get to be really interested in, an expert even, in subjects that before you had no interest mm -hmm. whatsoever in. Um, I can tell you all about um, the, uh, the placing of these plants, the upholstery on these chairs. Now, that's right. something that I've never been interested in before. <laughs> Different types of varieties of window dressing. Um, I know all about now. My husband had no idea what gingham was until gingham we got married. Gingham is a thing that I have currently... <laughs> become very familiar with. So anyway, you begin to learn about all these different things. So my wife is a bird lover. She's a bird watcher. And, um, and I have inherited from my wife a, a love for birds. And she taught me this. In 31 years, no one taught me this, that the mockingbird apparently has no uh, original song that it sings. What mockingbirds do, it's not just a clever name. What mockingbirds do is they mimic the songs of other songbirds. And in areas where other songbirds don't live, mockingbirds, they just make bird noises, but they don't mm -hmm. sing songs. Um, so you could be walking down the street, you think you hear a cardinal, you think you hear a robin. 
it's, it could be a mockingbird. Both songs could be a mockingbird. And I started to think about that as an analogy um, to, at my very best, only want to, to say what I see said in Scripture. Um, at my very best, I would want to communicate Jesus' words. Um, and so the analogy in the song became, you know, I hope, at my, I hope at best to be only a mockingbird, to only reflect, to give you the song, to sing you the song that I've heard another sing. Hopefully these would not be my words. Um, and, and that became kind of the thesis for the new record. And, it, and it's, it's a record about social advocacy, um, about social injustice in our world. Um, that is the work of the Christian. I mean, there are two parts to proclaiming the gospel. The gospel is Jesus our Savior, um, proclaiming the good news of Him, and also of His kingdom coming. It's, there's two parts to it. And we're good at the first part. We're pretty good at the first part. The second part we're terrible at. Um, proclaiming a kingdom where there will be no suffering, no poverty, no hunger, no disease, no weeping, no disaster. Um, this is the kingdom that we are to proclaim. And in proclaiming it, we preach the gospel. Um, and it's putting our hands to that work. I mean, the, 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 gospel, the coming of Jesus' kingdom is the being made right of all things. That's the day we have to look forward to when Jesus' kingdom uh, comes in our world. Um, and, and, we, and we can put our hands to the being made right of all things. We can feed hungry people. We can take care of people suffering from disaster. We can give medicine to people who have disease. That's the work of the Christian. That's how we proclaim the gospel. St. Francis said, you know, to proclaim the gospel wherever you go and if necessary use words. It's a great quote. It breaks down quick uh, depending on how you look at that quote. But I would like to think that Francis meant go in and proclaim the coming of the kingdom of Jesus by putting your hands to the being made right of all things. Mm -hmm. And let that be the proclamation of the gospel enough to where people know the goodness of God. And if necessary, go on and tell them about the good news of Jesus. But, but your social work will be a pre-evangelism to them seeing the beauty of Jesus because these are the, the values, the kingdom values that he's instilled in us to come and to take care of people. The early church seemed to be much more focused on mm -hmm. the coming kingdom when mm -hmm. all things are about to be made right. What's happened during the past 2,000 years? Well, the past 2,000 years have happened, for one. Um, and I think we just, it was John Calvin who once said that the hearts of men are like little idol factories, that they, they day and night crank out new things for us to worship. And I think as time goes by, we, we, what Christians want, we don't want the Holy Spirit. Here's what Christians want. We want a new law. That's what we really want if you ask us. We want a new law. We don't want to be taught about how the government works and how politics work and how, what our role in that might be. And we don't want to know about all that. The, 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 the nuances and intricacies of a two-party system and, and how to not be name-callers, but how to learn how to be co-agitators, but to commend the good in everybody, to work alongside of everybody to bring about you know, the being made right of all things. We don't want to know about all that. What we want to know is who to vote for. That's a new law. We don't want to know about how to identify truth and beauty in culture. We want someone to label our music and tell us what's Christian and what's not. We want a new law. That's what we want. What we don't want is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is a lot more difficult to tell someone, I'm going to teach you um, how, to, how to be able to listen to the Spirit and how to say, Spirit, show me wh where's the truth and beauty in this art, in this culture. Because it's not only in what's called Christian. It's, it's, it's everywhere. And as far as creation, you find the beauty of God, the truth of God. Learn to identify that, not to be fearful of a culture that we haven't categorized. Well, it would certainly be easier in many ways, if you think about it intellectually, to have a new law. Because it would, it would be a lot easier if Jesus outlined, when you find yourself in this situation, yes. here is the prescription. Here's what you do. This is what Every you do. Time. A, B, C, and D every single every time. time. Instead, the Holy Spirit comes alongside and says, I'm going to guide you. Yeah. What is right in one situation mm -hmm. may be wrong in, in another. In this moment, speak. In this right. moment, be silent. I mean, you just, and again, it's, it's so much more difficult. How do you teach that? But how easy it is it to go to people and say, you know, you come down the aisle and you, you pray the prayer and here's Jesus and with Jesus, here comes your gift bag and it's got all your politics mm -hmm. and all your culture and all your music and all your art and all your stuff your sexuality, everything's in that bag, and you just take that and don't even worry about the rest. But that's just not how Christianity works. I mean, we have the Holy Spirit as a helper to guide us in the truth. We have God's Word to show us. Uh, but in the areas that are in our world currently are not uh, as clear-cut, um, we have the Holy Spirit to guide us. And it's, it's not our job to make a new, a new law for people to make this Christian thing easier. That's just not our role. We can't really do that. But that's what we want. And I think in wanting that new law, um, in making an idol out of every little thing, worshiping anything but Jesus in any given moment, that's a lot of the problem where the church is today. Um, 
that's where we've come in the last 2,000 years. You know, we just had a lot more time to come up with a lot, a lot more innovative <laughs> sin and idols. I mean, you know, and we have a lot more to repent of. I mean, it's a, it's a great time. There's a lot to repent of. And that's the work of the church is to be in repentance continually. We have much to repent. We need Jesus more now than ever. Mm. Uh, we need Jesus. The Christians need Jesus more now than ever. We are a sinful bunch. Uh, we have much to repent of. And, and so this is a great time for the church because there's much to repentance and a big Savior for our great need. And maybe these are issues that you're struggling with and grappling with. You probably want to be led by the Holy Spirit, but don't even know how to begin. Well, that's where our prayer partners come in. They are loving, caring people who are at the end of those telephone lines that you can call, and they will pray with you. They'll talk with you. They will help you. Let's go over to our prayer lines now. All right. Thanks so much, Rhonda. Norm's away today, but <clears throat> I have the privilege of being here in front of our wonderful prayer partners ready to take your call. And I like what Derek had to say about kind of turning things upside down the way maybe we've often viewed things. And Jesus was like that. He kind of turned thinking of many upside down, talking about loving your enemies, doing good to those who, who curse you, talking about if you want to be great, if you want to be a great leader, be a servant. And uh, he said a lot of things that kind of turn things upside down for us. If, and the one he said is if you want to save your life, you lose it. What does that mean? Well, it's, it's meaning it's, you turn it over to Jesus. You turn it to Him. And that's what uh, someone realized when they called our prayer lines. She said uh, she saw no answer to her situation. It's very difficult. Maybe you can relate even today. Uh, she said religion was not helping. And that can be true if it's just you're just looking for, for God and for answers in just the religion and, and ceremony and things that aren't really uh, true life. Uh, that won't help because it, it's a person. It's a relationship with Jesus. She said family and friends were not helping. But she realized uh, the truth of the Bible, that she was a sinner, as we all are, the Bible says, and that Jesus came to forgive sin and she accepted Jesus into her life and became a new person and the Bible talks about that in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace and his grace is available for you right now you can just reach out you can say a simple prayer Lord God forgive me for my sins I realize that I'm a sinner I need you and I come to you now I give you my life wash me clean make me a new person in Jesus name we'd love to talk to you further about that uh, you can ask questions if you wish you can call in a prayer request and the numbers you see on your screen are available 24 hours a day seven days a week now to look a little further into God's word his love letter to us is Nazar Shaheen with let there be light for today here's his teaching From Greece, close to the city of Athens, I'm going to speak about Titus chapter 3. Behind me you can see a famous temple. It is the temple of Poseidon, or the Roman name Neptune. According to Greek mythology, he was the god who ruled over the seas. He was the patron of fresh water sources, springs, and rivers. He is uh, the brother of uh, Zeus the father of all the gods, and he is the brother of Hades, the god of the underworld. Paul is, uh, is writing a personal letter to Titus, and it's considered one of the pastoral letters. In chapter 3, we move from the conduct to the groups inside of the church in chapter 2. Now he's dealing with the general conduct outside and in the church. He is exhorting and encouraging Titus uh, to, uh, to deal with the church as, uh, with the behavior as citizens, citizens of heavens. Uh, that means he's asking them to be obedient to the civil authorities. As citizens of heavens, that does not exclude us from obedience to the civil authorities on earth. As long these laws does not contradict God's word. Also, he's exhorting him to deal firmly, very strongly with those who cause dissensions, those who cause factions in the church and controversies 
through the discussions and through the arguments between themselves. He asked him to stress sound doctrine, to rebuke the false teachers who try to spread heretic teachings, heretics, and of course to sp those who speak about genealogies. That is the position of Titus. That's why he was left in, in the island of Crete, which is an island in the Mediterranean Sea. It's a very difficult position. However, he was asked to supervise the ministry, to ordain qualified leaders for the ministry, and to stress sound doctrines, and to stress good works in the church to reflect the fruit of salvation. Another important fact, we see a doctrinal statement in this chapter, uh, chapter 3, verses 4 to 7. I encourage everyone to memorize these verses. Simply, he is emphasizing the kindness, love, and mercy of God in salvation. We are not saved by works of righteousness. We are saved by regeneration, a new birth. We become a new creation. This is the work of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, He works uh, in restraining Satan from stopping us to believe in Christ. And the Holy Spirit regenerate us and convicts us, of course. Then it speaks about justification by grace. And he speaks in these verses about the hope for eternal life. It speaks about the second coming, which is the hope of the believer. In other words, this is the complete gospel. Not only the gift of God in our salvation, but it is something more for the future. We become adopted sons in the family of God. We become heirs. That is simply the teaching of Paul to, to Titus, to keep the order in the church and to organize it so it will grow in a powerful way against any wind of teaching, against any obstacles, and of course, it's very important in this chapter, good works as a fruit and result of that regeneration, that gift of salvation, so that we can live as citizens of heaven. From the city of Rome, join us next time on Let There Be Light, as we look at the Apostle Paul's letter to his friend Philemon. All right, thanks so much, Nazar. And I do want to remind you once again that you could call our prayer lines anytime. I, uh, with Norm being away, I picked up a few of these that he usually reads, but a lady called with, a, had been diagnosed with, with a, a lump under her left arm and she wanted prayer. And so whether, no matter what your situation is, uh, we'd love to Give talk and pray with you. Bye-bye, thanks for being with us. If you live in or are visiting the Burlington area, we invite you to visit the Crossroads Center to join our live studio audience please call 905-335-7100. This program is funded through the generous support of 100 Huntley Street viewers. For membership information or for further ministry, visit our website at crossroads.ca or write Box 5100, Burlington, Ontario, L7R 4M2. Closed captioning has been made possible through funding provided by Wortman Cookies, Traditional Family Baking, Quality guarantee. On the next 100 Huntley Street, India's Bollywood is the largest film industry in the world. Hear the compelling story of one of its well known classical singers, Vijay Benedict. Also, young people from across the country are flocking to Prince Edward Island. Find out why on the next 100 Huntley Street. Don't miss it.